Good morning. Welcome to our online stream service. We are so excited about what God is doing, and we know that God is going to meet you at the very point of your need. We know that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or even think of. Right. And I want you to know that God got you today. Amen. You are Amen. on his mind, and he's going to make a way for all of us to get through these difficult times. So let's stand and let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or even think of. And I pray, Lord, that as we enter into your presence, God, that you would meet us at the very point of our need. Yeah. Lord, even though this service is being live streamed, I pray that the presence of the Lord would come into every household and that he will meet us at the very point of our need. And so, Lord, you just do what needs to be done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Glory to your name. Thank you, God. 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 Th
Jesus, I love you. Put your hands to the throne and say. 
Jesus. Jesus. Lift your hands to the throne and say, Lift your hands to the throne and say,
many of you know that God is concerned about each and every one of your needs? He wants to meet you at the very point of your need. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. And we want to pray for you during this difficult season. So I'm going to ask Sister Carmela to come and she's going to lead us in prayer just concerning what's going on in our society right now and what God want to do in our lives. Sister Carmela. Come on and pray with me. Just Lord, we thank you, God, that you're concerned about all things. Thank you, Lord, that you know us, oh God. You know us by name, oh God. And we thank you that you love us with an everlasting love, oh God. And Father, we pray your divine protection, God, your divine healing be upon us this day, God. If you need healing, I pray that you will reach your hand towards the screen and ask the Lord to heal you, to touch your body right now and make you whole. In the name of Jesus, by his stripes, we ask that you be healed, that you will be covered in the blood of Jesus. Even now, God, that you will watch over our homes, God. Cover us in your blood, oh God. Don't let any harm, hurt, or danger come upon our dwelling, oh God. We ask right now in Jesus' name, watch over our families, oh God. Keep us as we go to and fro, oh God. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would do it, oh God. Well, you are a great God. You are a mighty God. There is nothing too hard for you, oh God. So everything that concerns us, oh God, right now, we place it in your hands. We lay it at your feet, oh God. That you, oh God, will make all things new, oh God. And that you will make it well. That it will be so. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, God. We trust you, God. We grab a hold of your hand, God. Asking that you would guide and direct us, oh God. And that you will lead us, oh God. Doing in this time, God. We are our, our faith is sure in you, oh God. We trust in you. You are excellent, God. You are mighty and powerful, God. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, you are our rock, you are our strong tower, and you will we trust, oh God. And we thank you today, God, as we look to you, oh God. You will meet us at the very point of our need. We thank you that you're Jehovah. Jireh, the Lord God that will provide. So we ask right now that you will meet every need, every household, every family. Cover us and keep us, God, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you today. In Jesus' name, amen. An urgent call to prayer by the way of conference call. You are invited to join our church family in prayer this Tuesday, March 31st from 7 to 7.30 p.m. Prayer will cover the COVID-19 pandemic and other areas of concern. You will be given a telephone number to dial and a code to enter to connect to the phone conference line. Email us at the House of Peace. The number four, the letter U, at gmail.com. Thank you. View us online this Wednesday night for Bible study at 7 p.m. at ptag4u.org. Once again, ptag4u.org. God bless. At this time, we come to a very important part of the service. As you know, that uh, there are a lot of churches across America that is not able to have church, and we need to make sure that the church will be able to stay open, even though we may not be able to have services at this time. But we need your financial support. We need your su financial support, and we're just asking you if you can help us financially. You know, there are several ways uh, that you can help us with. Uh, there are several ways. Uh, our church office will still be open during the day, Monday through Thursday, uh, to 4.30. And if you need to bring uh, an offering by, you can make it out to the House of Peace. Um, and then uh, you can drop it off. Or you can go online and you can give uh, to... Cash app. You can give to Cash app. And uh, a Cash app is uh, the dollar sign House of Peace Jacks. So you can give there or you can go to uh, our uh, website, the House of Peace for you dot org, and you can give online to our PayPal account. And so uh, 
would you just please help us? Would you just please give a generous offering? We would greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much. Once again, I want to thank you for watching our online service. And at this time, we're getting ready for the word of God. Today, God has given me a very encouraging word for you. He told me to tell you that even though things don't seem to be getting better right now, you have to stay the course because there is light at the end of the tunnel which is the title of this anointed message. I want to say it again. You have to stay the course because there is light at the end of the tunnel. Now, I know this coronavirus pandemic is beginning to escalate and it has turned so many people's lives upside down and inside out all over the world. No country is exempt from it including us as America, as Americans. As a matter of fact, this past Thursday, the news reported that the U.S. has surged past China and Italy to become the planet's most infected nation. And then this past Friday, the news also reported that the U.S. became the first country to record 100,000 confirmed cases of the coronavirus. Wow. <laughs> wow. Let me say it again. Wow. This is a severe milestone in the coronavirus era. It's a reminder of its deadly culture changing effects on us as Americans. Because of this, we have a significant number of Americans that are being quarantined to their homes for at least 14 days if they're sick with a temperature, fever, and cough, or have been in contact with someone that has the virus. Some cities are on lockdown and have a curfew. The stock market has taken a major hit. People are feeling financially stressed, afraid they're going to run out of money before the month runs out of days. Some have been laid off or even have lost their jobs. All schools are closed. Tourism and travel have grounded to a halt. And in most states, the government has ordered the closure of all restaurants while still allowing carryouts and drive through services to continue. You know, I can go on and on about everything that's happening right now. But as a result of this, more people are increasingly becoming weary, anxious, uncertain, and stressed. I'm sure all of you can relate to what I'm saying. There's no question. We're in a difficult season and selling, and we are selling in uncharted waters. But even though this is going on right now, let me say this to the people of God. And even let me say to this to people who will become the people of God. We still have to believe that the Lord has us in his hands and remains in full and complete control. Let me say that again. Let me say it again. We still have to believe that the Lord has us in his hands and remains in full and complete control of what's going on right now. You know, I like what Job said through his episode. He says this in Job chapter 12, verse 10, and I'm reading from the ESV. He says, in his hands is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. But sometimes, you know, we can read certain verses from Scripture a hundred times, but yet fail to take them to heart the way the Lord wants us to. You know, um, when the Lord gave me the title for this anointed message, State of Course, There is Light at the End of the Tunnel. I remember when the World Trade Center was bombed in 2001. President Bush said this. He said, stay the course. Now, this phrase is commonly used by politicians. He said, we would stay the course in our fight against terror. 
uh, I want you to think about what does stay the course mean? To stay the course is to stand firm in pursuing a goal or course of action, to preserve in the face of whatever challenges or obstacles one may encounter. Another definition said to continue doing something until it is finished or until you achieve something you have planned to do. I want to look at the, synonym, the synonyms for stay the course. Uh, the synonyms for stay the course are words like hold on, keep going on, persist, press on, proceed, pursue, stand firm, continue, maintain, remain, be determined, be resolved, be stubborn, carry on, go for it, go on, hang in there, hang tough. Boy, those are some powerful things that we need to do if we're going to stay the course. Now, even though things don't seem to be getting better right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have to stay the course that God has mapped out for us because there is light at the end of the tunnel. Let me say it again. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We will get through this. We will get through this. You know, there's uh, one of my favorite scripture is Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, that says this, reading from the King James. It said, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. I think I need to say that again to you. Hallelujah. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, yes, we're in a season of difficulty, but that season is going to come to an end. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. And then there's a scripture also in Psalms chapter 119, verses 1 through 6 and then verse 8. And I'm reading from the Message Bible. It says this, you are blessed when you stay on course, walking steadily on the road revealed by God. Verse 2. You are blessed when you follow his directions, doing your best to find him. Verse 3, that's right. You don't go off on your own. You walk straight along the road he sets. Verse 4, you, God, prescribe the right way to live. Now you expect us to live it. Verse 5, oh, that my steps may be steady, keeping to course you set. Then... I'll never have any regrets, regrets comparing my life with your counsel. And then the psalmist says this in verse 8. I love this. Look what it says. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Don't ever walk off and leave me. Boy, that is so powerful. I need to read that again. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Don't ever walk off and leave me. And I want you to know that if we do what God tells us to do, he will never leave us nor forsake us. You know, people, we need to learn how to hear the voice of God for his direction for our lives. Let me say it again. We need to learn how to hear the voice of God for his direction for our lives. I want to say to you today, don't be de be, don't be deterred by fear and anxiety because of what's going on right now. Please stay the course. Stay the course in serving the Lord. Stay the course in your battle against fear, anxiety, panic, and discouragement. Stay the course in your battle against sickness or disease. Stay the course in believing that God is going to meet you and your family needs. He's going to meet you and your family needs. God's going to take care of you. But you've got to believe that. You need to stay the course if you're not getting the hours on your job that you normally would get because God can make up the difference. I'm telling you, he will make up the difference if you just stay the course. Stay the course in being an encouragement to other people and helping them when you can. How many of you know that there are so many people that need help? So many people that need encouragement. And we need to just come alongside of people and just say, hey, 
I'm here to help you. You don't have to do this by yourself. So we need to just help people. And then not only that, but we need to stay the course in, in witnessing to people who need the Lord in their lives. There are so many people that are open to hearing the gospel and wanting to know more about God and who Jesus is. And we've got to be there for people to help them to find our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gives us peace. He gives us peace. You know, some years ago, I preached an anointed message. Don't give up, don't give in, and don't give out because it's not quitting time. Let me say it again. Don't give up, don't give in, and don't give out because it's not quitting time. Yes, for some of us, this may be a time that we feel weak and going through some struggles in our lives. But we have to keep reminding ourselves that God does not forget his plan for us. But sometimes we do, and that will lead us off track. Let me say it again. Hallelujah. We have to re keep reminding ourselves that God does not forget his plan for us. But sometimes we do, and that will lead us off track. And I don't want to be off track. You know, the Bible tells me in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17, it says this. I am the Lord your God. Say that with me. I know, I know this is an online service, but I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. That is powerful. In the way that you should go. And so while we are waiting to get to the light at the end of the tunnel. This is what we've got to do right now. God has given me four points to give to you. The first point is we got to stay positive. Let me say it again. We got to stay positive. Virginia Sartre said this. Life is not the way it's supposed to be. It's the way it is. The way you cope is what makes the difference. I want to ask you something. How are you coping with this right now? Because that is what's going to make the difference. Now, I know this may seem like a cliche, but the thing about cliches is, is that they're typically true. Staying positive is only a small part in getting through the difficult time, but it's a very important part. You see, when you stay positive, you're putting yourself in the best position possible to not only make it through these bad times, but you become a better person in the process. You know, most people do one or two things in life when it takes a turn for the worse. They either remain positive and remind themselves that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that they are going to make it through. Or for a lot of other people, they curl up in a fetal position and they relegate themselves to being a victim of what's going on right now. You know, oh Lord, why is this happening to me? And why is this happening to our country? And I don't understand. And God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just don't know what I'm going to do, God. Now, I'm not saying you can never have a bad day or get a little discouraged or shed a tear. But what I'm saying is you have to eventually pick up the pieces and start moving forward. You need to start marching forward, start moving forward. A man, I, the story is told of a man in Dundee, Scotland some years ago. Um, he was confined to a bed for 40 years, having broken his neck in a fall at the age of 15. But no matter, but in spite of what had happened to him, he was able to stay positive. Therefore, his spirit and attitude remained unbroken, and his cheers and courage inspired so many people 
that he enjoyed a constant stream of guests. People just wanted to meet with him. They just wanted to talk with him. They just wanted to know, how, you know, how do you stay positive? How do you stay positive? One day, a visitor asked him, doesn't Satan ever tempt you to doubt God? Oh, yes, replied the man. He does try to tempt me. I lie here, and I see all of my schoolmates driving along in their carriages, and Satan whispers, if God is so good, why does he keep you here all these years? Why did he permit your neck to be broken? Why would God, if he's a good God, why would God do something like that to you? The guest asks, what do you do when Satan whispered those things? The man replied, ah, replied the invalid, I take him to Calvary, I show him Christ, and I point to those deep wounds and say, you see, he does love me, and Satan has no answer to that. He flees me, he flees from me every time he hears me say that. We've got to learn how to stay positive in difficult situations or in difficult times. You know, the Apostle Paul is a great example of this. Uh, he was saying some things in the book of Philippians. He had learned how to be content whatever the circumstances. And, and Paul had been through a lot of things. He had been shipwrecked. He had been stoned. Uh, he had sleepless nights. I mean, uh, I mean, he, he had been beaten. He had been thrown into prison. But, you know, in spite of all of that, this is what he was able to say in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. He said, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Verse 11, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned to be content. You know, if I have, I'm grateful. If I don't have, I'm grateful because I know that God is going to make a way out of no way. So I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Verse 12, he says, I know what it is to be in need. <laughs> and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Verse 13, I can do all things, hallelujah, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Or I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Or who strengthens me. Also, this is something that we have to realize too, is that we got to stay positive. We got to stay positive. You know what Paul said in that same chapter of Philippians chapter 4, verse 8? He says this in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. We got to think. Things may not be the way we want them, but we can think of some things that God can keep us encouraged. You see, when you live by faith, you live independent of circumstances. Joy is the result of practicing your faith, the result of putting your faith into action. You see, the faith life is not dictated by circumstances and is not restricted by the five physical senses. Faith not only acts independently of your five senses, but faith acts independently of your circumstances. You know, that's something that we all need to think about. You know, we can't always see it. And we don't know how God is going to work it out. But we know 
that if God be for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors. If we know that, then we can sing like the old people used to say, I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Oh, I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Be all right, be all right, be all right. You see, your joy is not dependent on your circumstances, but your joy is dependent on following the instruction in God's word. The second thing I want to talk to you about is focus on what you can't, uh, I'm sorry, focus on what you can control, not what you can't. Let me say it again. Focus on what you can control, not what you can't. Let me start out by asking you a question. Because of what's going on right now, are you filled with worry and anxiety because many things are out of your control? Think about it. Right now, so many people are worried about their children, their finances, their job security, their health, and fear of catching and dying from the coronavirus. Yes. We've got to be concerned about those things. But we, we can't be so concerned that we get so stressed out uh, that we can't function the way that we need to function. Mm. You see, this pandemic is beyond your control. And no matter what you do, you can't change it. Let me say it again. No matter what you do, you can't change it. When we focus on what we can't control, often it takes our energy and attention away from what we can control, and there's the rub. Focusing on what we can't control makes us less effective and potentially leads to the outcomes we fear the most. You know, there's a story in the Bible uh, about Job. And uh, Job was always fearful that something bad was going to happen. Something bad was going to happen to his children. And he would pray for them. And, and, and then one day, the thing that he feared happened. And he said this, the thing that I fear the most has come upon me. The thing that we fear the most has come upon me. You see, focusing on what we can't control makes us feel less effective and potentially leads to the outcomes we fear the most. The more time and energy we spend on things we can't control, the less time and energy we're spending on ways in which we can make a difference. Therefore, you have to realize that you're setting yourself up for frustration when you focus your time and energy on things that you can't control. You're also making the situation seem even more bleak than it actually is because you're focusing on the negatives. Now, this is one of the reasons that Alcoholic Anonymous meeting incorporated the serenity prayer that states, God Grant me the sincerity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Let me, let me, let me, let me say that again. God, grant me the sincerity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. You know? You don't have to be a religious person to see the value offered in that prayer. Some things in life are just out of control. Some things in your life is just going to be out of control. You may run into people you don't get along with or have to wait forever in line to get your cup of coffee. A flight might get canceled at least once in your lifetime. You can't prevent a storm from coming. 
but you can prepare for it. You can't control how someone else behaves toward you all the time, but you can control how you will react to them. You can influence people and circumstances, but you can't force things to go your way. Everything is just not going to go your way all the time. And at this time, we can't control this coronavirus pandemic, but we can take necessary precautions to lower the chances of getting it. Yes, we have a scary pandemic that has popped up in all of our lives right now. But we have to trust God to get us through this difficult time. And we do that by learning to fully trust God. But let me say this. Learning to fully trust God isn't always easy. Because it's a lifelong process. We have to choose to trust him. I'm going to say it again. We have to choose to trust him. Much like we have to choose to give up control. We need to learn to let go and stop trying to figure out the whys of life. Let me say it again. We have to stop trying to figure out the whys of life. You know, I'm a pastor, and right now, uh, we can't have church on Sunday morning. And uh, there's a lot of things that are happening. You know, we need finances to, to take care of the church, to pay the bills. The bills don't stop. And I know that this is his church. And uh, I know that this thing did not catch him by surprise. And because it did not catch him by surprise, I have to believe that he's going to take care of us. I believe that he's going to take care of his people. You know, Jesus said this, I will build my church. Not Pastor Nelson. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so I have to believe that God knows what he's doing. And I have to believe that even though we can't have physical church, God has given me creative ways to have online church and, and to believe that God is going to meet the needs. And guess what? He's meeting the needs. And so we have to understand that God is in control. Now, let me say this. When we struggle to give up control, it's usually out of fear of the unknown. We don't want to face whatever is in front of us blindly. However, God has promised that he will always walk beside you. No matter what circumstances you face in life, you will never venture into your future alone because God has always promised to be there for you. I like what Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 says. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That is some powerful stuff right there. He's with you. He's with you. He's with you. The third thing I want to say to you today is be optimistic because of your faith and hope in God. Let me say it again. Be optimistic because of your faith and hope in God. Now, some of you might be saying to yourself, isn't being positive and being optimistic the same thing? No. So if it's not the same, what's the difference between being positive and being optimistic? Being positive, as I said earlier in point one, is focusing on all the good things in your life even when you're hitting some bumps in the road. But being optimistic is believing that good things, events 
will happen in your future, regardless of the present situation. I know, hallelujah, that because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all my fear is gone. Because he lives, I know who holds my future because he lives. And life is worth the living because he lives. See, that's being optimistic. Hallelujah. That's being optimistic about your future, regardless of the present situation. But by nature, most people tend to be either optimistic or pessimistic, regardless of their relationship with God. Everyone's glass is either half full or half empty. It's just all how you see it, half full or half empty. Now, let me show you what biblical optimism is. It is the result of faith in the character of God. Let me say it again. It is the result of faith in the character of God. The Bible refers to this as hope. Look what it says in my opening text. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Would you say that with me? As you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I have to read, read that again. Once again, it said, may the God of hope, hallelujah, hope is future. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we hope in God, we put our trust in his sovereign plan above what our circumstances tell us. I, I, I like what Romans chapter 8 verses 24 through 25 says. It explains it this way. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not have yet have, we wait for it patiently. You see, Paul is speaking of a future reward and the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Yes, he's talking about that. But I believe that that can be applied to now. You see, regardless of what may happen in this life, I want you to know that 1 Peter 5, 7 tells you that God cares for you. Let me say it again. God cares for you. He's not some impartial observer with no vested interest in the battles you fight. He wants you to win. He wants you to grow and overcome. And what's more, he gives you the equipment and the strength to make it happen. You see, the confidence can give us an optimistic outlook, even in difficult circumstances. Biblical optimism does not place so much emphasis on earthly events. But you know what? It can accept difficult circumstances can't accept that if you believe what Romans chapter 828 tells us that all things work together for the good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Hmm. Godly hope looks beyond what we understand to view life from God's perspective and not our perspective. God's design for us is to live with hope. Psalms chapter 43, verse 5. This is what David says when he was depressed and was filled with anxiety. But he began to ask himself this in Psalms 43, verse 5. He says, why, my soul, are you downcast? 
Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. He recognized, he said, hey, I can't continue to be depressed. I can't con continue to be with, filled with all this an an anxiety and discouragement. You know, so I, I need to put my hope in God. I need to put my hope in God. You see, optimism is a choice. When we choose to trust God for everything, we can rest in his promises to take care of us the way he sees fit. The way he sees fit. We can cast our cares upon him, as I said earlier. We can let our requests be made known unto God according to Philippians 4 6. We can accept his peace that passeth all understanding according to the Philippians 4 7. Knowing that <laughs> we have a loving heavenly father who desires to care for us and provide for us. And I want to say he will give every child of God a reason for true optimism. And then the last point I want to give to you today, don't go through this by yourself. Let me say it again. Don't go through this by yourself. I want to say this again because we all need to hear this. Don't go through this by yourself. Um, I like what Ecclesiastics chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, it says this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Verse 10, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And then verse 11 says this, and if two lie down together, they will keep one. They will keep warm. But how can one warm alone? Verse 12, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Man, that's powerful. We don't have to go, we should not go through this thing alone. We should have people in our lives. How many of you know we are all in this together? And we'll all get through it together. Say that again. We are all in this together. And we'll get through this together. Now, those of you who have a little bit of age, you might remember a song that Barbara Streisand sang. One of the lines went something like this. People, people who need people are the luckiest people in the world. Now, <laughs> I'm not sure what she meant by that because we all need people. The problem is, is that not everyone realizes that. So we might change that line to read, people who realize they need people are the most fortunate people in the world. Do you realize that? We all need people. We all need people. Having the right people around you is one of the most important things you can do for yourself when times get tough. You want to surround yourself with people who are loving. You will want to surround yourself with people who are caring, who are honest and available. You know, there are many scriptures in the Bible that, that, that demonstrates why we need people. Proverbs 18.24, reading from the King James. A man that have friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17, reading, through, reading the NIV. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. I thank God that I have people when 
I felt like giving up when I didn't even want to be in the ministry anymore, that I had people that I could call and I can vent and I can talk to and, 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 and they would listen and they wouldn't be like Job's friends that said, you must got sin in your life or God is not pleased with you, but they, they listened to me and man, that just helped me. And we all need friends like that. Now in these verses of scripture, Solomon is trying to tell us something. He's trying to tell us something. It appears, however, that Solomon had something vastly different in mind when he penned these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Solomon is saying that a brother is born to help us in tough times. Family is there to help us in tough times. Other people are there to help us in tough times. A brother, by definition, sticks with you when adversity strikes because that is what family does. Brothers prove they are brothers in the moments of adversity. Brothers are brothers in the fullness sense of the word when adversity strikes. You know what? Not only do we need people to be there for us, but you need to be loving because a little love always makes bad days seem a little brighter. You need to be caring because when we are caring, it helps us to let people know that we care about them. We care about their well-being. We're not in it just to get something from them or to even get something to them, but we care about them. You know, the gospel family in our churches must commit to walk through the deep pain and sorrow of life together, to be there when things are hard, and to stay when things get harder. See, I don't just want to hear people say, I got your back. I want people to have my heart. And I want to know that when things are not going well, you're there for me. You're there for me. You're there for me. Not just with your words, but you're there for me. When you don't agree with me, when you don't understand, you're there for me. You see, the love of Christ should control us, helping us endure even when we are, when, when, when we are sinned against, being willing to lay down our lives for the sake of others, even those who have hurt us. But, you know, we also need to be honest. You need someone who can look you in the eye and tell you the truth. Their honesty may be that one piece of information you need to get through this tough times. I thank God. Once again, I got people in my life that don't always tell me what I want to hear but they tell me what I need to hear. And the reason that I can listen to them is because I ask myself, are they trying to tell me these things to hurt me or are they telling me these things because they love me? And if I know they love me, I need to listen even when I don't want to listen. So we need people in our lives that can look us in the eye and tell us in the truth and say, you need to get over this. It's going to be all right, even if they make you mad. I want to start bringing this to a close. We all need people to be available. <laughs> when you pick up the phone looking for some compassion and honesty, it helps to have someone who's actually going to answer the phone and they're going to be there for you. Even when they're busy, they say, hey, I can do that label later. You see, we need the church and as the church of Jesus Christ, we are designed to live and function in dependence on one another. 
We are the body, a team, if you will, and we function best when we all work together. When we all work together, and we got to work together. Not only that, but community is also important because it helps us to have someone who understand what it is that you're going through, and they can relate to your situation. If you find a community who has been through what you're going through, you can find out how they made it and then apply that to your own life. I want to pray today. I want to say to you once again, stay the course. There is light at the end of the tunnel and God can meet you where you are. He can meet you at the very point of your need. And I also want to say that if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, He's here to meet you. He's here to forgive you. He's here to accept you into His family. If you're not sure if you were to die today, and you need to accept Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Would you pray this prayer with me? Lord, I recognize today that you love me. And I accept that. And I ask, Lord, that you would forgive me of all of my sins. I ask that you would come into my heart and be my Savior and be my Lord. I believe that you, Jesus, are the Son of God. And I believe that you died for my sins. And so I accept that by faith. And I make you my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name. If you meant that, if you really meant that, you have been born again. And some information is going to come up on the screen. Hallelujah. To help you. To, uh, to help you to make it through. And I want to say to the body of Christ, stay the course. There is light at the end of the tunnel. God bless you.